Welcome back scholars and this video is on writing balanced chemical equations. So to write a balanced chemical equation you need to know what is reacting in the equation and perhaps also what is formed. And when writing balanced chemical equations, one of the first steps is to balance charges in individual compounds. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. The second step then would be to balance elements across the reaction. And so with these steps, let's say we've got a description of a chemical reaction, something like zinc reacts with an aqueous solution of lead to nitrate to form zinc nitrate and lead. So first thing would be to convert the names of these compounds or elements to symbols. And so the zinc is just zinc. What kind of element is zinc? It's a metal. And what form are all but one metal in at room temperature? A solid. What's the only metal at room temperature that's not a solid? That would be mercury, which is a liquid. Now, another element, gallium, does melt above room temperature. Its melting point is low enough that if you put it into your hand, you could melt that metal in your hand, but that is still a solid at room temperature, even though it melts around 35 degrees Celsius or so. So notice we have the zinc down and we have put the solid state symbol along with it. And then we have the lead to nitrate. So we know lead is Pb. We know nitrate is NO3. We know the lead two, the two tells us that the charge on the lead is two plus. We know nitrate is one minus. So to balance those charges, we have to have two nitrates here. We know this is an aqueous solution, so this would get a Q as its state symbol to show that it's in solution. And this reacts to form zinc nitrate and lead. Now the zinc nitrate, the zinc is always two plus. The nitrate is still one minus, so that means we still have two nitrates there and we have the lead. Now the lead is again is a metal, it's an element by itself, it's a metal and metals at room temperature are gonna be solids. The zinc nitrate, this is an ionic compound and until a later unit for now, we're always going to think of these ionic compounds as being aqueous, unless you have some other way of knowing what happened. So if this was a precipitate, there would be a description that would say that, you know, the zinc precipitated out with its uh, salt, whatever it was formed. It would give you a color of something that would form. Um, in this case though, the lead would count as the precipitate because it's a solid and it's being produced in the reaction. So this would be the first step. The second step would then be to balance elements across the reaction. 
what we can do here is we can make a little list. And so we can see that there's one zinc, there's one lead, and if the nitrate stays together, we can actually count that as one big chunk. And there are two nitrates on both sides. We could also choose to split that up into nitrogen and oxygen. Remember that we distribute the subscripts through polyatomic ions. So there's two nitrogens and six oxygens. If we look on the other side, we also see one zinc, we see one lead, we see two nitrogens, we see six oxygens, which is because there are two nitrates. So right now, as this reaction is written, it's balanced on both sides. So why is it important to balance reactions? When you balance reactions, what you're doing is you are following the conservation of mass or conservation of matter. And this is that matter <clears throat> cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. And of course, as we saw earlier in the semester, Nuclear reactions are the exception to this, where nuclear reactions do destroy and create matter. But the key for nuclear reactions is that energy is conserved. And when energy is conserved, it follows this E equals mc squared, where the energy and the mass go back and forth. And we saw this earlier with the idea of mass defects. When matter is conserved, that means that we should see the same atoms, the same elements on both sides of the chemical reaction. If we have that element on the left side with the reactants, we also have to have that element on the right side with the products. We can't have anything missing. We have to have the same elements and we have to have, have the same numbers of those elements. So let's look at another reaction. Let's say that we've got aluminum chloride reacts with bromine gas to form aluminum bromide and chlorine gas. So from this description, aluminum chloride, aluminum chloride. The aluminum is always three plus, chloride is always one minus. So this is AlCl3. It reacts with bromine gas. Bromine, remember, is a diatomic element. So for your diatomic elements, remember Brinkle, Hoff, or HnoFCLBRI the upside down L. That means this bromine exists as Br2 and it's bromine gas. This reacts to form aluminum bromide, which again, the aluminum is three plus, the bromide is one minus, and chlorine gas. And again, chlorine is diatomic. So then the question is, what kind of states would the aluminum chloride and the aluminum bromide have? 
Well, nothing is said in this, in this description about water or solutions, and these are ionic compounds, so our default should be to think of those as solids if we have no other information about them. So now we look at this reaction and we could list the aluminum, the chlorine, the bromine, the aluminum, the chlorine, the bromine, and we see that there's one aluminum on both sides. There are three chlorines and two bromines, but then there's only two chlorines and three bromines. So looking at this, we've got something here that's not quite right, something that's not balanced. If we pick one element and start with that, we can see what happens with the rest of the reaction. So it doesn't really matter which one we go for, but chlorine here is listed in the middle. It's the first one we come to that's not balanced. So how could we balance three chlorines with two chlorines? Well, notice that this side, this is the only source of the chlorine in the products, and that because it's diatomic, it has to be even. So if this has to be even, we should be thinking, how can we make this into an even number? So this is where coefficients come in. Just like in math class, when you have a polynomial or you have parentheses and you have a coefficient in front of a compound, if we say that there are two aluminum chlorides here, then that means that we now have two aluminums and six chlorines. How can we get six chlorines in the products? The coefficient would have to be three. That makes that six chlorines. So now the chlorines are balanced. But what's not balanced now? Well, we just unbalanced the aluminum, right? So we have two aluminums now in our reactants. We need two aluminums in our products. So we could put a coefficient here that gives us two aluminums. What else does that change though along with the aluminum? It also changes the bromines. So now instead of three bromines, we have six bromines. Over here, we only have two bromines. So how do we get six bromines here? With a coefficient of three. Now everything's equal on both sides. If we do one more. If we say something like um, calcium chloride, reacts with phosphoric acid. The products from this would be calcium phosphate, which would be a solid, and HCl, which could be dissolved but it could also be a gas. So remember back to our first step when we're trying to write a balanced chemical equation. It's always the balanced charges in the individual compounds. And so HCl, you could think about drawing a Lewis structure for that. Since it's a covalent molecule, and you could see that that's balanced with 1H and 1Cl. You could also think about the chloride ion that would be formed from that acid when it reacts in water, and that chloride ion has a charge of 1 minus, so there should be 1H in the molecule. The calcium phosphate also needs to be balanced. The calcium is always 2 plus. The phosphate is three minus. If we cross the charges, that means there are three calciums and two phosphates. So that's not even starting to balance the reaction. That's just looking at the charges and the compounds in the reaction. Now notice that we have phosphate here and we have phosphate here. That phosphate stays the same in the reactants and the products. There's no phosphorus anywhere else in the reaction. There's nothing that's turning into the phosphate. The phosphate is not turning into something else. 
So we can treat that phosphate as one unit and follow that through. So then we've got calcium, chlorine, hydrogen, and phosphate. And there's one calcium, two chlorines, three hydrogens, and one phosphate. Calcium, chlorine, hydrogen, phosphate. I'm just listing it in the same order that I already did. Now there are three calciums, one chlorine, one H, and two phosphates. So what do we need to do here to balance? Again, you can pick almost anything to start with. Just because it's listed first, I'm gonna go ahead and go with the calcium. I need three calciums here, so I'm gonna say three calcium chlorides. That gives me three calciums and six chlorines. Now I'm gonna follow the chlorines through, so I need six chlorines. So I'm gonna say there are six HCl, but then that gives me six Hs as well. Because there are six H's and I only have three here, I'm gonna double this. That gives me six H's and two phosphates. And now I have two phosphates and my numbers of everything on both sides are equivalent. This is now balanced. So remember when balancing reactions, the first step is always to balance charges in the individual compounds, especially if you're trying to turn from a word reaction or a word equation into a symbolic equation. In this process here where we balanced elements across the reaction is called balancing by inspection. And I will always give you, for these kinds of reactions, I will always give you reactions that you are able to balance by inspection, which would be this whole process down here. Now you don't have to show these tallies. I didn't see this until I was um, student teaching for chemistry actually originally. I didn't, never saw it done this way when I was in high school chemistry. We just learned how to do it in our heads. You can certainly think through this in your head. The tallies are just a nice way of kind of organizing things and seeing where you are for it all. So this is the video for balancing chemical reactions and turning them into chemical equations.